Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for stats. In this lecture we're going to talk about data transformations, percentile rank, z-scores, and the standard normal distribution. This is the last set of slides for the first quiz, so I hope that, that this basically ties together everything we've been talking about up to this point. So when we're talking about data transformations, what we basically mean is when we are transferring scores or transforming scores from one set of scores to another set of scores. So let's say you've got an X scores of one, two, three, and four. Now you can do different types of transformations to these, but basically what we're talking about is we're talking about transforming these scores. So we've got an X prime transform score. Let's say we added three to each of the scores. So we've got four, five, six, and seven. So we've added three to each of the scores. That's actually a linear transformation. We'll get to that on the next slide, but there's three types of transformations we can do. We can do linear, nonlinear, and z-score. But again, when we're talking about transformations, we're talking about transforming numbers, transforming all the numbers from one score into another score. Let's look at that first one, linear transformations. So linear transformations essentially are ones that are just moving the, the values. They're not changing, and I'll even bring this up right now, we're not changing the shape of the distribution. That's an important thing with linear transformations. You're just moving the values. You're not changing the shape. So it's things like multiplication and division as well as addition and subtraction, at least when multiplication isn't involving zero. We'll come back to that in a, in a couple slides. But important thing is, is that other than multiplying by or dividing by zero, a linear transformation either just involves multiplication and division, addition and subtraction, or a combination of the two. So the mean and the standard deviation change, uh, the standard deviation will actually stay the same if you're just doing addition and subtraction. That'll change if you're doing multiplication and division. But in the mean will go up or down depending on what you're using, but the shape stays the same. So over here on the right, you see an example of a linear transformation. That is this one here, where our x primes, our altered x scores, are equal to 2x plus 5. So we're doing both multiplication and addition. So each of these scores, you, you multiply it by 2, then add 5. So we have our raw scores here, then our transform scores here. Well, over on the right here, you see that the means are here in this, in, not the means, but the the measures of the descriptive statistics are here on the left for the unaltered scores. The descriptive statistics on the right are for the altered scores. So you see that the mean changed, the uh, variance changed, the standard deviation changed. So you got changes that occurred, but going back, the shape of the distribution didn't change. So let's say you had a shape like this, your shape afterwards is still going to be like that. Uh, not exact, but close enough where you're going to have the, the same shape before and after. So we get to a question, why do we use a linear transformation? Uh, one of the main or biggest reasons to, lose, to use a linear transformation is because since you're not changing the shape of the distribution, all you're doing is, is changing its location it is sometimes easier to uh, understand numbers when we change the location. The example we've got here is this reaction time example. So the reaction time of 0 0.0001 seconds. That's a hard number to deal with. So if we multiply it by a thousand, then we can start to see differences. So we start to see the difference between 0 0.0002 and 0 0.0001 is that two is twice as high. And so what ends up doing is, is it makes it easier to work with. So usually we do linear transformations when we want to make the data easier to work with because it can still be interpreted in the same way. We don't always do linear transformations, but again, sometimes it makes it easier and the, the biggest benefit to linear transformations is, is it can be interpreted in the same way. 
The next thing we'll look at is nonlinear transformations. So nonlinear transformations are actually going to change the shape of the distribution. They're going to change the skewness and the kurtosis of a distribution. So you can already see that the, that the benefit to doing a nonlinear transformation is to eliminate skewness and kurtosis. If you have things like outliers, a nonlinear transformation can help control those. So some examples here, x squared, 1 divided by x, log of x, x times y, things like this where you're going to typically preserve rank order, meaning a one score that's below another score is going to remain below it. Another one that's below another is going to, or they're going to reverse, as you see over here on the right, one divided by x, the smallest number, which is five, becomes the largest, but at the same time, the, the rank order, the order they're in, is preserved. So ones that, that preserve rank order can actually be used to correct for skewness, which again, to do parametric statistics, to use your mean and standard deviation in doing statistics, you need to have a relatively standard distribution, you need to have low skewness. So in this case, doing a nonlinear transformation is one way to do that. Most people don't do this, but it is something that you can do in order to do parametric statistics. So why conduct it? If you have skewed data, you can uh, then, if you have a nonlinear transformation that preserves rank order, not all of them do, but if you have one that preserves rank order, you can change the shape of the distribution. So it allows you to run analyses that require you to have a normal distribution. However, the diff disadvantage is, unlike a linear transformation, it is difficult to interpret the data after you've done a nonlinear transformation. Your ability to say what the values mean or what your numbers mean basically goes away when you do a nonlinear transformation. So it is generally not advised uh, it's a higher order statistics thing, and we're not going to do it in here, but at the same time, it is something just to be aware of that you can do. So how do you figure out if a transmit transformation is linear or nonlinear? And I recommend knowing this because it's, a, it's an important thing to know, but use the equation y equals a plus bx. We'll come back to this. This is basically your linear regression equation, but you can figure out if a transformation is linear by looking at this equation, y equals a plus bx, and, and then you can, from this, if it fits this, for all b's not equal to zero, then it's linear. So that first one, it was something like uh, y equals five times two x plus five. So it was the b was two and the a was five. It fit there, b was not zero. So it was a linear transformation. If it doesn't fit this, it's going to be nonlinear. Let's actually look at an example of that. So a couple examples. The first example is scores are going to be multiplied by 10 and then 25 is added to them. So we've got y equals 10x plus 25. It fits this, this over here that we've got and b is not equal to zero, therefore it is linear. Next example, scores are multiplied by zero and then 10 is added. So it fits this over here, but since b is equal to zero, it's nonlinear. And then the final example, y equals x squared. It, it does not fit the, the line from up here, the y equals a plus bx. There, since b is not a constant, it is nonlinear. Okay, let's transition into talking about the normal distribution. So the normal distribution is essentially the normal curve. It's the theoretical distribution of population scores. It is going to be 
look roughly like that. I am a bad artist. Maybe I'll draw a few more that get better. But it is symmetrical. That means the left and the right side are supposed to be a mirror of each other. That's where you can see that I'm not necessarily that good because at drawing this because it's not that symmetrical. That's a little bit more symmetrical, but not still not perfect. But again, symmetrical means the left and the right side are the same. It's bell-shaped, so if you look at it, it looks like a bell. Um, and why is it important? Why are we talking about this? Because many of the variable variables in the field of the social and behavioral sciences are normally distributed. They are the normal curve. Uh, arousal, achievement, IQ, I could go on and on and on. There are thousands of variables that are normally distributed. So the normality of a population of scores of variable interest is an assumption in many of our inferential statistics tests. So when we get to inferential statistics in a couple weeks, I'll start looking at, when we look at each of the tests, I'll actually give examples of these, what's called assumptions. Um, so each test to do it has assumptions. These assumptions are, again, requirements of what that need to be met to do the test. The, the variable, variable being normally distributed is an assumption of every parametric test there is. So just about all inferential statistics tests, all of the parametric ones need a normal distribution. There are ways you can get around that. We'll talk about that later. But the point is, is it is assumption of all uh, parametric statistics. On this slide, we have the empirical rule. So the empirical rule is when you've got a normal curve here, we've got a normal distribution. You have uh, some basic things of uh, that, that we know, some basic rules that we know. So for a true normal distribution, something that is completely symmetrical, completely bell-shaped, a true normal distribution, first off, these are standard deviations. So we've got one standard deviation above, two standard deviations above, and three standard deviations above the mean. Then one standard deviation below, two standard deviation below, and three standard deviations below the mean. The percent of scores that are going to fall within one standard deviation of the mean is equal to this 68.2 percent. The percent of scores that are going to fall within two standard deviations of the mean is this 95.4 percent. And I ran myself out of room, but within three standard deviations of the mean, went a little bit too far over. Let me just erase that and start over. Within three standard deviations of the mean is this 99.7 percent. So this is the empirical rule. I would know the basics of the empirical rule. We'll actually probably come back to that later in the semester. But the empirical rule, knowing the basics of it, is important. I think I keep getting louder and louder as I get farther into the slide, so I'm going to talk, try to not talk as loud. If you have trouble hearing me, let me know, and I'll, I'll go back to talking louder. But I'm going to talk in more normal tone now. Uh, let's look at some practice for area under the curve. So we want to ask the question for this first question, what percent of scores fall between negative one and negative two standard deviations from the mean? Well, that's this number right here. So we got 13.6%. What about what percent fall within two standard deviations of the mean? So within two standard deviations is between the, the negative two and the positive two. And that is this 95.4%. You could even ask things like, what percentage fall between negative 1 and positive 2? Or let's look at negative 3 and positive 1. So negative 3 and positive 1. Well, then we would do the 34.1, 34.1, 13.6, and 2.1. Uh, so then add those together, we get the 68.2, 78, 
So 83.9% are between negative 3 and positive 1. You can do anything like that. So the next thing we're going to talk about, and this is basically what we're going to talk about for the rest of these slides in various different ways, is z-scores. So z-scores are, are important to statistics because they are essentially a type of transformation, but they're also what's called a standardized score. So they're standardized in such a way that allows us to then make comparisons between different data sets. So the purpose of a z-score transformation is to transform raw scores into uh, standardized scores. And this is a linear transformation. If I drew this, if I extrapolated this out, uh, you would find that this is a linear transformation. But that's besides the point. The point is, is z-scores are converted to standard scores by basically giving a distance of standard deviations from the mean. So a z-score is in a sense, a z is in a sense a it talked about in standard deviation units. So a z-score of 1 is going to mean it's one standard deviation above the mean. A z-score of negative 2 means it's negative 2, it's two standard deviations below the mean. Because of this, z-scores help us put particular individual scores into a perspective. We can convert things to z-scores and then get percentile ranks. So anytime you talk about something, somebody's percentile rank, typically it's converted into a z-score first to get that. Um, and because z-scores have the same shape as the, the raw scores from which they are transformed, they are useful in serving as a descriptive statistic. And in a sense, what it comes down to is, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in the next few slides, but what really comes down to is, is that a z-score allows us to basically look at scores in a relative sense. So going into that a bit more, and I, I've already talked about this some, but a z-score is a relative distance from the mean. A, a, again, a z-score is just how many standard deviations from the mean a score is. So you can take a distribution that has 10 people and a distribution that has 1,000 people and look at their scores as relative to the other scores in the distribution and make a comparison. Normally, if you've got n's that are that different or let's say you're looking at trying to compare uh, ACT to SAT scores and they've got different ranges, they've got different meanings, well, by converting them to z-scores, you can then make comparisons between the tests. There are two very important properties of z-scores, and I'm going to ask you these again. I'm just telling you that now. First is that the set of z-scores has a mean of zero. So the mean is zero. So if you have a z-score of zero, you're at the mean, and a standard deviation of one, meaning like I've already said, a z-score of 1 means it's one standard deviation above the mean. And as I've said a couple times, but I just want to put it on the slide, the usefulness of z-scores, the reason we do z-scores is because it allows us to make comparisons between different distributions. Even if our units are different between the distributions, even if the, the means are different, the standard deviations are different, we can then it, it, all of that, we then convert those raw scores into z-scores, and they are now in a standardized format. Another term for z-scores is standardized scores. So z-scores, they're a standardized score, they're, and it allows us to make these comparisons between different uh, data sets. Let's look at some examples here just real quick. Um, so we've got... Uh, let's look at this. So Z formula is what you see here. You've seen it on a few slides, but Z equals our raw score minus our mean divided by the standard deviation. So in this case, uh, the means of 3.43, that's what is here and here, and the standard deviation of 1.59, that's there and there. But our raw scores here are what we're looking at. So in this one, we're looking at a raw score of 5. 
In this top one, we're looking at a raw score of 5. It translates into a z-score of 0.99. Here, a raw score of 2 translates into a z-score of negative 0.9. Important thing to note here, the mean is 3.43. This first score, 5, it's above the mean, so it has a positive z-score. This 2 here on the bottom one is below the mean of 3.43, and that's why it has this negative z-score. Let's look at a different data set, but you're going to see we get the exact same z-scores. So in this data set, we've got a mean of 11.86 and a standard deviation of 3.18. So this 11.16, it goes in the formula there. 3.18 goes in there. And this raw score of 15 ends up with a z-score of 0.99. And the raw score of 9 ends up with a z-score of negative 0.9. And again, you can double check this. 15 is above our mean, so it's a positive z-score here. 9 is below the mean, so it is a negative z-score here. So with these two different data sets, you have the same z-scores for different raw scores. And this is what it allows us to compare. So if on the previous one, the, the z-score of 0.99 was a raw score of 5. So it was x equals 5 for this top one. In, in this data set, it's x equals 15. So the equivalent score in this data set to a 5 from the previous data set is a 15 because they have the same z-score. The same with the other value on the previous slides, the bottom one, it, the, it was x equals 2, but in this one it's x equals 9. The equivalent score to a 2 in that other data set, in this data set, is the 9. So someone who scored a 9 here is going to be the same as someone who scored a 2 in the previous slide. I hope that makes sense, but that's the main reason we use z-scores. Let's use a few more examples. As I said, the, most, the majority of the slides here are about z-scores. So let's look at... Well, now why or in what situation would this be beneficial? And we'll look at more of a practical context. So a student takes three midterm exams. In English, they get a 81%. In math, they get an 88%. In biology, they get an 86%. So we ask ourselves, okay, on what test did they do best? Well, in absolute terms, we can look at these and say, oh, yep, math. They did the best in math because an 88 is better than the others. But if we asked how about relative terms, not how well did they do just uh, on the test itself, but how well did they do in relation to the classes that took the tests with them? Well, to do this, to, do, to find how well they did and the test they did the best in relative terms, we have to now convert each of these to raw scores. To convert each of these to raw scores, though, we need more information. We don't have enough information on this slide. We need the mean for each test and the standard deviation for each test so that we can convert each of these to a z-score. On this slide, we now have that data. We have the mean for each test and we have the standard deviation for each test, so we can now convert each of these to z-scores. We're going to do the z-score for English. So it's going to be the raw score, which is 81, minus the mean, which is 78, divided by the standard deviation, which is 4. We get 3 divided by 4, or 0.75. So a z-score of 0 0.75. Uh, important, not important thing to note, just kind of a, a note of when do you use zeros before the decimal place and when you don't. Uh, it'll come up a few times this semester. I'm not picky about it, but technically any time the number can go above 1, you use a you you put the zero before the decimal point, but if the number only ranges from zero to one, or negative one to one, then you don't put a zero before it. So when you have a correlation, correlations can only range from negative one to positive one. 
and you get, let's say you've got 0.5, you wouldn't put a zero before the 0.5. And when we get to p-values later, since p-values can't go, they range from zero to one, you don't put the zero in front of the p-value, in front of the decimal place. Okay, that's that's pretty arbitrary to what we're going we're we're doing right now. But let's look at the z for the math now. This is going to be 88 raw score minus 92, uh, which is the mean divided by the standard deviation of the math scores, which is five. So we get negative uh, four divided by five, or negative 0.8. Just erase that so it's clearer. We've got negative 0.8. So for our English, we've got positive 0.75. For our math, we've got negative 0.8. Let's do our final one, Z for bio. It's equal to 86 minus 82. Uh, so the raw score minus the mean. Divided by the standard deviation, we get 4 over 6. Or 0.67. So in terms of this, our z-score for English is 0.75. Our z-score for math is negative 0.80 and our z-score for biology is 0.67. So when we're looking at this, now we can ask the answer the question on which test did the student do best relative to other students in the course. In this case, it is now English because that has the highest z-score. Sorry about the squeaking. Okay, next thing we'll look at in relation to this is what's called the standard normal distribution. So we talked about the, the normal distribution already. Let's look at the standard normal distribution. The standard normal distribution is basically the distribution of z-scores. So it's got some properties to of note. Uh, which we'll talk about on the next slide, but it looks just like the normal distribution, except in this case, we don't have to put the standard deviation symbols because a z-score of one is equal to a standard deviation of one. A z-score of negative one is equal to a z-score of negative one. So it is just like the normal distribution again, except it's now the standardized normal distribution. It is the distribution of z-scores. The important properties of the, the, the normal distribution is, first off, the entire area under the curve. So we're going to draw it in in blue. This entire area under the curve is equal to 1. That's important because that, that is something that uh, we're going to use in our math calculations later. So just note that the total area under the curve, so all values under the curve, which would be all values within the data set, all values within the distribution, it, you add them all up, you get one. Uh, the uh, next is the mean is, and let me just do, and yeah, I know I'm horrible with my, my drawing, but the mean here is equal to zero. So the mean is zero, but also uh, this this will be valuable handy in uh, the math we're doing later. The area to each side of the mean is equal to 0.5. So when we get to the to the slides talking about that in just a little bit I'll go into that a little bit more but the the point is is by knowing that the area to each half of the mean is 0.5 it allows us to do some of the math that we need to do when we're calculating area under the curve which is something we'll be doing in just a little bit 
So again, why are z-scores important and why is this area under the curve important? Because it now allows us to calculate the, the relative location of an individual in a data set relative to other people in the data set. And then for, through that, we can then calculate the percentile of an individual, which is an individual's ranking. If they're at the, the 75th percentile, basically in that case, you're going to have they're at a point, so the mean is the going to be the 50th percentile, just like when, when we're dealing with, we talked about before, median. So the mean is the 50th percentile, since it splits the data set in half. But let's say you've got over here, and I'm going to draw it in blue. You're over here, this is your score. And the area here, that's all in blue, area equals 0.75. That means that you're at the 75th percentile. Your ranking is the 75th percentile. It also allows us to calculate the, the percent of people between any two points. So the area between any two points. Uh, that is just too bad. Let me try a distribution again. So let's say, and we've got our mean here, but we want to know the amount of scores between these two points, the percent of people, the percent of scores between those two points. We can, if we know the z-score for this point and this point, we can use the standard normal distribution to figure out the number of scores that are between those or the percent of scores, not the number, not the absolute number, but the percent of scores that are be between those two points. This slide is just some handy information. Uh, when you look at the study guide, you'll see that I, I recommend knowing this for part B. You don't need to know it for part A. But this, you can take the z-score, the z, the z equation here, and you can, through algebra, get the different formulas for the different values here. So you can get a formula for your raw score, a formula for your mean, and a formula for your standard deviation. Let's look at those. So the formula for the raw score is going to be equal to uh, z times your standard deviation plus your mean. The formula for the mean is equal to your raw score minus your z-score times your standard deviation. And then finally, your formula for your standard deviation equals the raw score minus the mean divided by the z-score. So the, the point here is, is if you need to, let's say, find a raw score and you're given a z-score, then you can use this formula here to find the raw score. And there are actually times where that's, that's relevant and important. Let's say you got a, you did, you took two tests that had different scoring methods, all kinds of different things going on, and you wanted to figure out what the equivalent score on the second test is to the first test. So what you would do is, and we'll actually do this in one of the examples coming up, what you would do is you would start by taking that raw score from the score you got on the first test and get a Z for it. You'd calculate the Z score. And then you would take the mean and the standard deviation from the second test and incorporate the Z score you got from the first test and then you can get a raw score for that second test. Like I said, we'll, we'll have examples for that coming up. We'll actually look at the example of that now. So the, the statement is, I took the SAT, but my school wants my ACT score. Uh, both are essentially measuring the same thing, but they're on different scales. If you got a specific score on the SAT, how should you expect to do on the a ACT? And these might be different now. These are a little bit old numbers because they like to change their scales. But the SAT is 400 to 1600 with a mean of 1000 and a standard deviation of 200. It's a standardized test, so it has a standardized mean and standard deviation. Uh, it isn't converted to z-scores. What I mean by that is it's, it's going to continue to have a mean and a standard deviation that's the same over time. Uh, the ACT is on a 1 to 36 with a mean of 21 and a standard deviation of 5. If I scored a uh, 1350 on the SAT, what score should I get on the ACT? Well, to do this, 
we need to first convert that 1350 into a uh, into a z-score. So in this case, z equals, and if you remember, it was x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So our x here is 1350, our raw score, and then our mean of the SAT is 1000, and all divided by 200. So that's going to be equal to 350 divided by 200 which is equal to 1.75. So our z equals 1.75. Now, we need to then figure out what our raw score is on an ACT. And the raw score from the previous one, a raw score was equal to z times the standard deviation plus the mean. We just need to plug in values here. Our z-score is 1.75. Our standard deviation here is 5. And then our mean is 21. So we take 1.75 times 5. Sorry, give me just a second. Sorry, had to deal with something. Okay, back to 1.75 times 5. 1.75 times 5 is equal to, what is it? Something like 8.75. And then we add that to 21. So we get a total of 29.75. So a score of 1350 on the SAT is the equivalent of 29.75 on the ACT. Hope that makes sense to you. Sorry about the brief interruption there. Let's do a little bit more of that. Some other examples. Let's look at, so in, in if John scored an 88 on his first exam where the mean was 65 and the standard deviation is 10, um, assuming that his relative position remains the same, what's the standard deviation on his second test where the mean is 74 and he scored an 86. So first we have to convert the first one to a z-score. And again, z equals x minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. So it's going to be equal to um, equal to uh, what is it? 88 minus 65 divided by 10 or 23 divided by 10 or 2.3. Now we need to figure out the, uh, the standard deviation and let's actually just, we're going to, because it's actually asking for the variance here, we're just going to ask for the standard deviation. We'll ask for it straight up so we don't have to do that extra step. But what you would actually have to do here is then square it uh, I'll at the end show you what you could do or what you would have had to do but to calculate out the standard deviation it's equal to the raw score minus the mean divided by the z-score so now on this other test we've got a raw score of 86 a mean of 74 and a z-score of 2.3 so we end up with 12 divided by 2.3. 12 divided by 2.3 is. Can't do that in my head, so I gotta pull out the calculator. It is 5.22. So the, the S of X is that. If we wanted to then convert it to a variance, we would just square it, so it would be 5.22 squared which I'm not even going to calculate out, but that if you wanted to do the, the variance there, you would just square it.
Just real quick, the next thing I'll talk about is percentile ranks, because percentile ranks are uh, relevant to a lot of things when we're dealing with z-scores, because it'll allow us to understand and interpret some of the, the uh, charts that we're about to look at. So after this, we're basically going to look at charts the rest of the time and using and do examples from charts so that you understand how to read the z-charts. So a percentile rank is a value that tells us the percentage of scores that fall at or below that point. It's just like a cumulative percentage of a frequency distribution. Uh, I'm not going to draw it out on here because I already did uh, before when talking about percentile ranks, but it's basically the percent of scores that are at and below that point. I want to remind you of the, the empirical rule. It applies to the standard normal distribution as well. And this is what allows us to uh, basically do some of the math we're going to do on the next few slides. Specifically that uh, area over here is equal to 0.5. Area over here is equal to 0.5. Uh, total area is equal to 1, those types of things. So that, that's going to allow us to uh, understand a little bit more of what's going on with the z-scores. But if we wanted to, let's say, look at uh, percentile ranks would be at and below that point at the, at the median. Your percentile rank is 50 because half of scores are at and below that point. You can convert an area you get to a percentage by multiplying it by 100. So the area to the left of the mean here is 0.5. You can convert it to a percentage by multiplying it by 100. So you get a percentile rank of, of 50, 50th percentile because we multiplied that 0.5 by 100 to get 50. Let's actually start to look at some of these charts. So the, this is kind of complex in what you're seeing over here on the right. But uh, when we're dealing with this, we, we want to, uh, I want to get across what is going on in these charts. So on this one, I'm going to use a couple examples to show you what's going on here. But on, and then I'm going to show you some other charts that you can use that are useful, but we're not necessarily going to use uh, for this example. But when you're do, going to do the homework and you're going to do the first quiz, to have these charts handy is, is to have them available is, is going to be useful to you. So now we're going to start looking at these charts because we, we are converting to z-scores but we need to now interpret them. So the first question here, what percent of scores fall between the mean and X? So we've got our example score here. Our example score is 86. Our mean is 87. Our uh, standard deviation is six. So we convert that first into a Z-score. The first thing we do is convert to a Z-score, which I've already done for you, in that it is negative 0.17. So we want to figure out what percent of scores fall between the mean and let me, I got to be a little bit conservative on space here. So we've got our mean here, but then, and that is going to be the, the point of 87, but then we have this value over here, which is negative 0.17. It is to the left of the mean. And we are interested in the area between those two scores. Well, now we have to do a, a little bit of manipulation of the numbers. So the first thing we want to do, though, is, and um, I'm going to go back to red, is find the area below our z-score. That's what this chart is doing. So this chart, and I'm going to draw it up here. This chart is showing essentially everything at and below that point. So it's finding the area that I'm currently doing in blue up there. So that's what this, 
the z chart is doing so if and all of these z scores are negative here so they're all to the left of the mean but wherever the z score is so whatever z score we have here we we find it on the chart and it is essentially showing you the area that i have colored in in blue so the area i have colored in in blue up here and i should have used a different color because i used the dark blue down here but we'll just change this dark blue to purple down here so we've got our area in blue we need to find our z-score in the chart and it tells us that area so first thing we're going to do we've got negative 0.17 so we start by looking here going down and by looking by looking here and going down we find where uh, 0 0.1 is because essentially this is negative 0 0.17 so we need to find 0 0.1 because it's only giving us the first decimal place so we go all the way down to here to negative 0 0.1 and then we find the second decimal place which is the 7 along this side which is right here and we line those up And we get this number that's right here. We get 0. Uh, 0.4325. So in this one here, and uh, that's why I'm drawing in the blue here, we're interested in the purple, but I'm going to draw in the blue because that's what we just found there. We just found uh, 0. 0.4325. We technically don't have to do the zero there because it's an area. So 0.4325 is our area in blue. We need to find the area in purple though, because that's the area. What percent of scores fall between the mean and the X score? Well, to find that area in purple, we use that principle I keep talking about that the area to the left of the mean is equal to 0.5. So the entire area from this line right here to the left is 0.5 so if we take that 0.5 and we subtract out the 0.4325 that's in blue we are left with and let me just underline that in blue we are left with the area in purple because we're taking the entire area to the left of the mean taking away the area in blue all that's left is purple so we are left with uh, going to be what is it point zero sorry my tablet's doing funny things uh, so point zero six seven five so our area in purple the area between that score and the mean is equal to point zero six seven five I hope that makes sense to you because we took the 0.5 which is the entire area left of the mean we subtracted out the area in blue which is what that z-score shows the negative 0.17 which we found down down here and by subtracting that out we get the area in purple then the next question an easier question what percent of scores are lower than X the same percent that are lower than a z of negative 1.7 or negative 0.17 we already calculated that out that is what's in blue up here from above so it's going to be 0.4325 because it's then the the percent of scores below that and if we wanted to convert these to percentages it would then be 43.25 percent again you multiply them by 100 to convert to a percent so this up the pert one in purple was 6.75 percent then we let's say we ask the question what percent of scores are above x well there's two ways to calculate this we could do the principle of uh, that the t entire area is one and then if the entire area is one all we'd have to do is subtract out the blue region from one and we would get uh, the area the total area above that value 
So the total area, let's even use green here, the total area including that purple but above. So the total area above would be 1 minus the blue area. That would be one way to do it, so 1 minus 0.4325, it comes out to 56.75. Uh, percent because I multiplied it but another way to do it would be instead of that would be to take 0.5 which is the area to the right of the mean and add the purple region so in that case it would be 0.5 plus 0 0.06275 sorry and in that case you come out to the same thing which is 56.75% Either way, you get the same answer, but it's, it's just two ways to calculate it. I hope I wasn't too confusing there. I'll actually use a couple examples of various different things we can do in a couple more slides. But before that, I want to show you a couple of other charts, and then we will finish up with some more examples of, of how to do this. Okay, so this is the full chart. On the previous slide, you saw the the chart which is on the left which is negative z-scores now you've also got the chart that's on the right that's positive z-scores and again this chart in its entirety is values at and below that point so if we looked at a z-score let's just look at a z-score real quick let's say we had a z-score of 3.00 and that's down here you would first look positive looking for 3.0 we find this then you go to the 0, 0, because we're going to the second decimal place. So we've got here, line those up, and we get this value right here, which is 0.9987. And essentially what that's saying is 99.87% of scores are at or below three standard deviations above the mean. Again, this is mainly this, and the next slide is mainly for you to have for, for your purposes. Uh, this next one, I just want to show that there are other types of charts out there. Uh, sometimes you have to find them if, you, if you're interested in using them, but I'm not really looking at them here. I'm just going to continue to use those two charts from the previous slide. But there is charts that will show you the area above your z-score. And then there are charts that will show you the area between your z-score and the mean. So that first question we asked earlier the uh, negative 0.17 you got to remember this is symmetrical so z scores that are negative are going to be the exact same as z scores that are positive for distance from there to the mean but if we look at that one the, the 0.17 we go here 0.1 we come over here for 0.7 and we get this 0 0.0675 the same 0 0.0675 we got on that previous slide at least I hope that's what we use. I think that's what we use. So it's another way to find the exact same thing without having to go through the hassle of finding the area to the left of it and then doing 0.5 plus minus that. Okay, my clicker mixed, messed up and I was almost done recording the slide and I had to start over. So I'm going to go through it real quick because I just said all this and even though you didn't hear it, it, it did get it in my mind on how to say it. So we are now using these charts, at least the charts at and below that point, at and below the z-score, to uh, now calculate the difference or the area between two scores or the percent of scores between two scores. So we've got our distribution here our mean halfway between our mean which is actually 100 over here then we've got a negative score of 88 so when i mean negative i mean it's below the mean so this is an 88 we've got a positive score of 120 and we want to find the area between the two of those well how do we find the area between the two of those well we have to find the area for purple in the area for green and add them together first things first we have to find z-scores for each of these though so first we'll start with the z-score for 88 so it's going to be again the raw score 88 minus the mean 
divided by our standard deviation, which is going to be equal to negative 12 divided by 16, which is equal to negative 0 0.75. The next one we have to figure out is the z-score for 120. This is 120, the raw score, minus the mean of 100, divided by our standard deviation of 16, or 20 over 16, which is equal to 1.25. So the z-score here is equal to 1.25. The z-score here is equal to negative 0.75. From here, we need to then calculate the area between each z-score and the mean. And much like we did in the, the earlier example, for this first one, we can't calculate the, the z-score or the area straight up. We have to take 0.5 and subtract away the purple, or 0.5 and subtract away the blue here to get the purple. So we get this blue, let's, we're going to get, we're going to do 0.5 to get purple we're going to do 0.5 subtracting the blue and that is going to get us to our purple value but what is the blue value here well now we need to use this z-score here this negative 0.75 and find the area below that so we start with this c here we go to negative 0.7 which is right here all the way down here then we need to go to 0.05 over here line them up and you get a score of 0.2266 so we are going to take 5 and subtract 0.2266 from it to get the area that is purple so to get the area that is purple we take the 0.5 minus the 0.2266 and we get an area of 0.2734 so our area in purple is 0.2734. Now from there, we also need to calculate out the area for green. Well, to calculate out the area for green, we need to take and find the, the area under the curve. So we're going to actually use this right one because it's positive. And we're going to use over here. But we're finding the area at and below that point but we actually need to take away 0.5 because we're taking away everything to the left of the mean so if we drew it out like this we would want to subtract the blue so that we are left with the green and that's actually a good way I'm gonna go back and draw on the previous one where if we subtract away the blue we're left with the purple so on this one though, if we subtract away the blue, we're left with the green. The blue we know, because it's everything left of the mean, the blue we know is, in this case, 0.5. So it's going to be 0.5, or sorry, the area we find minus 0.5. So the area we find is then going to be, we're going to take 0.5 away from that, and we get our total area. So let's take this over here, this 1.25, and find it on the chart. We've got 1, we're going down, we find 1.2. 1.2 is right there. Now we need to find the 0.5 to go with that, the 0.05. We line those up, and we get a value of 0.8944. So the total area is 0.8944, but we have to subtract away 0.5 from that because, again, the total area at and below that point is everything, including what's below the mean, and we're only interested in getting to the mean. So we take in, we get a total of 0.3944. Now, to get the area between 88 and 120, we just add those two together. So we add 0.3944 to the 0.2734. We are left with uh, 0.6687 or 
66 point or 6678 66.78 percent of scores fall between a raw score of 88 and a raw score of 120. Taking that one step farther or just looking at a little bit more, what percentage of scores fall, uh, of all scores fall between his score and the mean? If we had a, uh, in this case, a score of um, 124. So let's draw this out again. We got the mean here of 100. Uh, we are looking for a score to the right because it's above 100 of 124. To to do it, first step is to calculate a z-score. So his z equals 124 minus 100 divided by 16 equals 24 divided by 16, which is equal to 1.5. So we find his z-score for 1.5. 1.50, we get 0.9332. But that isn't all of it because now we're looking between his score and the mean. We have to then take away what's to the left of the mean. So we have to take away 0.5 from that. We are left with 0.4332. Remember earlier I said that knowing that half the area is 0.5, the total area is 0.1 is very important. We're going to come back to it. Well, we are getting to the point where you need to know that so that you can do these. So 43.32% of scores fall between his score and the mean. What is his percentile rank? Well, we just calculated that out, everything at and below that point. So it's going to be 93.32%. So his percentile, you could say it's the 93rd percentile or the 93.32%. Uh, looking at another score, um, we're now looking at one below. So in this case, we've got again, and, and I'm just using these to give you more examples. We've got a mean of 100, but now we've got a score of 92 down here. Uh, find the z-score, 92 minus 100 divided by 16. It's equal to negative 0.5. So find negative 0.5, and that's going to be over on the, the left one. Negative 0.5 is here. It's negative 0.50. So we've got a value here of 0 0.3085. But unfortunately, this is our region to the left of the score. We want the, so actually that's what we're looking for is the percentile rank. So they're the 30th 0.85%. I was getting ahead of myself, but they're the 30th 0.85 percentile at and below that point. It's what's in gray there. And you can go on and look at things like, well, what's the area between a score of 124 and 132? Uh, that's just like the earlier one we did. Um, so we've got 100, but we've got a 124 here and a 132. So now we're, we're, it's a little bit different. Um, we need to uh, find this area, and I'm going to make it light blue, between these two points. Well, to find the area between those two points, actually, one, it, it's, it's a little bit more complex. It's probably the most complex thing we'll do, and that is we need to first figure out the area that is for 132, um, the area to the left of 132. So we'll do that as purple. So we're going to look at the area to the left of 132 for purple. So we're, we need to convert it to a z-score first. So the z for 132 is equal to 132 minus 100 divided by 16, which is equal to 2. Find our z-score for 2.0, which is going to be 
because it's over here. Um, now we need to find the Z for 124, which we already found earlier, which was 1.5. I'm not going to calculate it again. But the now, um, and actually, let me erase that. I want to use a different color for that. Uh, let's do green. Z of uh, 124 is equal to 1.5 in its area to the, the left. So the area here, area from that point to the left, is equal to this here, 0 0.9332. So we've got our area in purple, everything that's from this point to the left. We've got our area in green, everything that's to this point to the left. But we want to get the area in light blue. Well, how can you do that? Simple math. It, it, it might not jump right out at you, but there's actually very simple math that'll do it. That is, if you take the area for purple and subtract the area for green, you're left with blue. So purple is everything from 132 down. If you subtract everything from 124 down, all you're left with is light blue. So for light blue, we take 0.9772 and subtract 0.9332. We are left with 0.0440 or 4.4%. So 4.4% of scores fall between 4.4% of scores fall between a raw score of 124 and a raw score of 132, which is also the equivalent of a z-score of 1.5 and a z-score of 2. I hope that makes sense to you. So we've got two more slides to go. On this slide, we're going to look at just doing some percentiles for and finding raw scores for specific things. And again, I said you'd need to know the raw score uh, formula. That's why I've got it at the top again. But we need to find the raw score and z-scores for the 25th percentile. So we're actually going to do a little bit of uh, reverse engineering here. We've got a mean of 72 and a standard deviation of 10, but we don't have a raw score. To find the raw score, we're actually going to um, take the 25th percentile. We can actually find that on this chart. So the 25th percentile, if we look at, at our thing here, we've got our, our mean. Uh, the 25th percentile is going to be the left of the mean, and it's going to be a z-score we can find because it's going to be the point at which all score, 25% of scores, not all scores, 25% of scores are at and below that point. So if we go to our chart and find the point where we get to 0 0.25, 0 0.25 is, essentially means that the area at, at and below that point is 0.25, 25% of the scores. If we find the area of 0.25 or as close to it as we can get, we can from that extrapolate what the uh, the z-score is, and from the z-score we can find the raw score. So going down to this chart, and we do have to look at the one on the left because we're looking at below the mean. So we go through this until we find going down until we find 0.25 or as close as we can get, and if we look. 0.25 is going to be between these two scores here. It's going to be between 0.2514 and 0.2483. So that is going to be for negative 0.6. So the Z score is going to be negative 0. Point, and it's 6. And we've got a, we're halfway between 7 and 8. So it's going to be 0675, right roughly in that region. You could, if you if you wanted to, you could just do 0 0.068, 0 0.067. I'm not going to be too picky about it, but 
the the point is is it's between those two numbers the 0.25 is between those two numbers so you could just extrapolate out that it's it, it's about halfway between them. so that's how you'd find the z score now we've got to find the raw score well the raw score is going to be equal to the z which is negative 0.675 times the standard deviation which is 10 then added to that the mean which is 72 well negative 0 0.675 is equal to negative uh, times 10 is equal to negative 6.75 we add that to 72 we get a score of um, 65.25 so the raw score at this point is 65.25 the z score is equal to negative 0 0.675 and and now we have we know a z score and a raw score just from a percentile rank and we can also do the same in the other direction so the next one is find the 75th percentile well, that's going to be over here everything at and below this point uh, it's going to be the 75th percentile the z and i'm going to just save you some time but we'll look at it it's going to be equal to 0 0.675 that is because it's symmetrical the z score that's 25 percent above the mean is going to be equal to the z score that's 25 percent below the mean except not negative it'll be a positive value but if we did want to go and look at it down here we're looking for 0 0.75 in this chart 0 0.75 in this chart is halfway between these two numbers which is halfway between 0 0.67 and 0 0.68 so it is 0 0.675 and conveniently so the z-score is going to be equal to 0 0.675 the x-score is kind of the same thing but it's in the opposite direction so it's 0 0.675 times 10 plus 72 which again equals um, 6.75 plus 72 so in this case it's going to be 78.75 and now you've got a way to figure out z scores and raw scores when all you're given is a percentile Okay, this is the last slide, and the only reason I uh, point this slide out and I put this slide in because it's kind of just an extension of the last slide, we're just going to take it one step farther, and that is because this is a actual z-score that is important in stats. And that is, we're now going to ask, um, between what z-scores and what raw scores to the most extreme 10% of cases lie? Or so, in, in, a, in a sense, we're asking beyond what z-scores. So we actually have to, we're looking at 10% here. We have to split it up into 5% on each end. Negative 5% and positive 5%. Why are we doing that? Because we're looking at the most extreme 10% of scores. So if we've got our distribution with our mean here, we were interested in the most extreme scores. So the 5%, so the 5% or area of 0 0.05 on the, the far right tail and the 5% or area of 0 0.05 on the left tail so that we get the most extreme 10% of scores. 5% on each tail is 10% of scores total. So we need to find the z-scores associated with 0.05 here, as well as 1 minus 0.05 for the right. Why are we doing 1 minus 0.05? Because the chart is going to give us everything to the left and we're interested in the right. So we're in a sense looking for the 0.95 because that's everything to the left of that value. So for the green one, we are looking for 0 0.05. Let's look at the chart. I, I know where to find it pretty quickly. Um, it's going to be 
1.645 right here. Let's see if that shows up. 1.645. So it's it's going to be exactly halfway between 1.64, negative 1.64, and negative 1.65. Um, I, I know that off the top of my head because, again, like I said, there, there's two very important z-scores for statistics. One of them is 1.645 and the other one is 1.96. So in this case, we are looking at a z-score on the left end of negative 1.645. And that is the z-score. And for the blue, we are looking for 0.95 which again, it's symmetrical, so you should be able to find this pretty quick. Go to 1.6, go over to 0.4 and 0.5, and you find that 0.95 is halfway between those, so you get a Z of 1.645. So these are the, the, the Z scores at the 5% extremes. If you actually um, look at the Z scores at the 0.25%, or 0 0.025 or the 2.5% of score extremes on each end. So the 5% most extreme scores, you actually get 1.96. So 10% um, most extreme, let me actually just put this in, in red, 10% extreme is equal to Z of one equals 1.645. 5% extreme Z equals 1.96. And if you wanted to look at that, you could find 1.9 and then um, go over to 6 and you get this. It's not going to show up right. It, hopefully that shows up right. You get exactly um, 0 0.025. And the same on the other end, you're going to get 0.975 for 1.96, which is over here, 0 0.9750. Now we need to convert these to raw scores real quick, just using the raw score formula. So for the first one, we've got negative 1.645 times 10 plus 72. So we get 16.445, negative 16.45 plus 72 um, and we're left with what do we, what do we got um, 50 655.55 I think it is uh, I could be off by one there I was doing the math really quick in my head um, and then for the blue we get uh, 1.645 times 10 plus 72, which again is 16.45, but this time instead we're adding it to 72 and we end up with 88.45. So between which raw scores? So for this one, we've got 88.45 or Z equals 1.645. And on the left one, we get um, 55.55 um, or Z equals negative 1.645. Okay, that is the extent of the slides for this lecture. I hope it helps you out. Again, watch the, the exam review. I'm going to have that posted at the same time as this. Uh, and I, I expect all of you to do well and get the homework done before you do the exam, though. Thanks. Come on back.